Praise the Lord. Welcome, everyone. Welcome to the Upper Room Fellowship of Jesus Christ. This is our weekly campus study. This is campus study number 46. And before we go any further, I want to take the time to make sure that it's not me, but the one who we are reading about that's going to be in total control. Heavenly Father, in the name of your glorious Son, Jesus Christ, we thank you and praise you, Lord. We thank you for giving us this wonderful gift of your word. It's your love letter to us, our handbook for life, and it's uh, full of wonderful wisdom and, and understanding and revelation, and we ask you now to prepare each and every one of us to receive fresh truth today, to help us get to know you better and know who we are in you. With that, I ask you to be the one to speak through me and not me leading on my own understanding, that you help us all let go of any tradition that we might have been taught and mm -hmm. hear from you through your Holy Spirit. So we give you this study and we thank you for it in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Praise the Lord. All right. We are in the mini series called A Chosen Generation, Part 10. The chosen generation that we're reading about. In the Bible, it was a biological chosen generation, but it was a spiritual story meant for all those who would come home to cry to God and be led by him. Praise the Lord. Our foundational scripture is 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 9 and 10, where it says, But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light who once were not a people but are now the people of god who had not who had not obtained mercy but now have obtained mercy amen praise the lord if you are not speaking i'd ask you to be mindful of your mute button so we don't have too much interruption praise the lord so for all those who would turn and receive the salvation we become people of god and we obtain mercy and we are chosen to walk in his image praise the lord and be a blessing and also i have here second timothy chapter 3 verses 16 and 17 says all scripture is given by ins inspiration of god and is profitable for doctrine for reproof for correction for instruction and in righteousness that the man or woman of god may be complete thoroughly equipped for for every good work amen and although i always talk about the fact that scripture was the Old Testament. We're actually going to spend some time in the New Testament today as a reference to what we're reading about. Uh, so we can see that not only the physiological story there, but what it means to us spiritually as we move forward. Praise the Lord. Last week, we covered uh, Genesis chapters 24 and part of 25. And to highlight some of the uh, things we covered, it says, now Abraham was old. We've been reading about Abraham for quite a, quite a while now. He was old, well advanced in age, and the Lord had blessed Abraham in all things. Why did he bless him? Because he believed God. It's important for us to remember. It wasn't because he was better than anyone else. It was because he believed God. So Abraham said to the oldest servant of his house who ruled over all that he had, please put your hand under my thigh. That's how they would make a pact through him covenant and i will make you swear by the lord the god of heaven and the god of the earth that you will not take a wife for my son from the daughters of the canaanites among whom i dwell the canaanites were children of canaan and cursed be canaan and we covered that many weeks ago about how well, why canaan was cursed he saw his father's nakedness on well, his father ham saw his father's nakedness and he was the product of that a cursed generation uh, but you shall go to my country to my, and to my family and take a wife for my son Isaac and then jump to verse 12 and he said oh lord god of my master Abraham please give me success this day and show kindness to my master Abraham so this servant was a faithful man and he knew even though he was given instructions that before he did anything he would seek God for favor and guidance and that's what God calls us to do if we do that He's, he doesn't force himself on us, but if we stop and ask him to guide us and give us, to lead us and give us success, uh, he will do it because we asked. That's really what he wants us to do is ask. Praise the Lord. 
Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. If we think we have it all figured out and we know the way to go, we are just, our brains are little things that were God created and he, he knows all things. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he shall direct your paths. That's what the blessed life is. Seeking first him, his kingdom, Lord, uh, give me favor, show me which way to go, close all the doors you don't want me to step to. If we give it all to him, he will respond and we'll be blessed. Praise the Lord. Jump to tw verse, verse 29 through 33. Now, Rebecca had a brother whose name was Laban, and Laban ran out to the man by the well. So it came to pass when he saw the nose ring and the bracelets on his sister's wrists, then when he heard the words of his sister Rebecca saying, This man, thus the man spoke to me, that he went to the man, and he there he stood by the camels at the well. And he said, Come in, O blessed of the Lord, why do you stand outside? For I have prepared the house and a place for the camels. Then the man came to the house, and he unloaded the camels and provided straw and feed for the camels and water to wash his feet and the feet of the men who were with him. Food was set before him to eat, but he said, I will not eat until I've told about my errand. And he said, speak on. And we learned last week, he talked about how he asked God for guidance. He even gave a scenario and God actually let that scenario play out where uh, Rebecca would come and give him water and also water for the the camels and all of that. And that would be the one that God had chosen for Isaac. Jump to verse 49. He tells, the servant tells Laban, he says, now, if you will deal kindly and truly with my master, tell me, and if not, tell me that I may turn to the right hand or to the left. Then Laban and Bethuel answered and said, the thing comes from the Lord. We cannot speak to you either bad or good. Here is Rebecca before you. Take her and go and let her be your master's son's wife as the Lord has spoken. Amen. Praise the Lord. And that's exactly what happened. Jump to verse 61. Then Rebecca and her maids arose and they rode on the camels and followed the man. So the servant took Rebecca and departed. Verses 66 and 67. And the servant told Isaac all the things that he had done. Then Isaac brought her into his mother Sarah's tent and he took Rebecca and she became his wife and he loved her. So Isaac was comforted after his mother's death. Amen. Sarah died and, and now he's got. He's got uh, a wife to keep him company and comfort, comforted. Praise the Lord. Then we went on to Genesis 25 and we finished off uh, up at verse 11. So we'll pick it up at verse 7. The, this is the sum of the years of Abraham's life, which he lived 175 years. Then Abraham breathed his last and died in a good old age, an old man full of years and was gathered to his people. And his sons Isaac and Ishmael buried him in the cave of Machpelah, which is before Mamre, in the field of Ephron, the son of Zohar, the Hittite, the field which Abraham purchased from the sons of Heth. There Abraham was buried, and Sarah his wife. And it came to pass after the death of Abraham that God blessed his son Isaac, and Isaac dwelt at Be'er Lahai Roy. Amen. Praise the Lord. So we're following this chosen generation, this chosen bloodline. Abraham is now out of the picture. He lives on. Remember, Jesus said, I'm God of the living, not the dead. And Abraham and, and uh, Moses and all of them were living. Praise the Lord. And so that was what we covered last week. Were there any questions, comments, or revelations about anything we covered last week? Okay, praise the Lord. Then we move on in our story. We pick it up. We, we finished at verse 11 of chapter 25, and here we are. We go on to verse 12 through 16. We start our study for today. Now, this is the genealogy of Ishmael, Abraham's son, whom Hagar the Egyptian, Sarah's maidservant, bore to Abraham. Now, if you're new here, uh, we, back, this is what happened. And, and Sarah had not given a child. And so she thought, okay, well, let's make something happen here. She had a servant, a woman named Hagar. And 
told her, told Abraham, go into her so that she could have a kid for Sarah on her behalf. And so he did, but that wasn't the promised one. It was the works of man, and it didn't amount to any good. It was difficult. There was all kinds of problems because of it. And then many years later, 14 years, 13, 14 years later, finally, Isaac was born through Sarah. Praise the Lord. So this is the genealogy of Ishmael whom Hagar the Egyptian, Sarah's maidservant, bore to Abraham. And these were the names of the sons of Ishmael by their names according to their generations. The firstborn of Ishmael, Nebajoth, then Kidar, then Abael, Mishbam, Mis Mimsa, Mishma, Duma, Masa, Hadar, Tima, Jitor, Nafish, and Kedema. These were the sons of Ishmael, and these were their names by their towns and their settlements, 12 princes according to their nations. Amen. And we talked about those and the generations after that. Uh, we're nearing the end of discussing anything about Ishmael. So we're going to, before we leave Ishmael behind, we're going to look a little deeper into why was the story, what was the significance of having Jacob and Ishmael, what is the significance of Ishmael? And for us today, how does that play out in our lives? So we're going to move to the New Testament where it's going to refer to this story and see if God will reveal something to us today. Any questions, comments before we get started? Okay, first we're going to go over to the book of Galatians. And uh, it's going to refer to Isaac and Ishmael here. Galatians chapter 4, New Testament. This is for Christians. Um, verses 21 through 31. Tell me, you who desire to be under the law, do you not hear the law? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondwoman and the other by a free woman. In other words, a slave and someone who was free. He had two children, but he who was of the bondwoman or slave was born according to the flesh, which is how we're born into this world, by the way. We're born through our mothers, through water, and the water breaks, and we are born into this world in the flesh. And he of the free woman through promise, and the promise is a spiritual thing, which things are symbolic, for these are the two covenants, the one from Mount Sinai, which gives birth to bondage, which is Hagar. The law was given at Mount Sinai. This, for this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia and corresponds to Jerusalem, which now is and is in bondage with her children. The Jews at the time, through the time of Jesus, were always focused on the law, always trying to get everything perfect. And what the law does is actually bring us into bondage. But the Jerusalem above is free, which is the mother of us all. That's the spiritual Jerusalem that comes to those who are of the faith. Praise the Lord. For it is written, rejoice, O barren, you who do not bear. Break forth and shout, you who are not in labor. For the desolate has many more children than she who has a husband. We'll get more into this as we go. Now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are children of promise. But as he who was born according to the flesh then persecuted him who was born according to the spirit, even so it is now. And that's what happens is when Christ sets us free, we get persecution from people who are still hung up on the law. Nevertheless, what does the scripture say? Cast out the bondwoman and her son, for the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. Bear with me. I know this is difficult, complex, but we're going to have a lot of scripture here that hopefully will help us see clearly uh, the difference between bo being born of the spirit or being born of the flesh into this world that we start out with. So then, brethren, we are not children of the bondwoman, but children of the free. That's talking about Christians who are in Christ, who have, have received the gift of salvation through Jesus Christ's sacrifice on the cross. Praise the Lord. And that's where we get this freedom in Christ. 
Any questions about Galatians 4 before we go on to the next section? It's kind of a pieces of a puzzle that I pray that when we're done, we'll open our eyes to the truth. Any questions? Comments, revelations? Okay. We'll try to wrap all this up when we get to the end. John chapter 8, verse 31 through verse 36. Then Jesus said to those Jews who believed in him, now they, those who believed in him, not the ones who are just hung up on the law. If you abide in my word, listen to his voice and follow him, that's how you believe in him. You are my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. Praise the Lord. There's a freedom that comes with the truth and Jesus is the way, the truth and the life. They answered him, we are Abraham's descendants and have never been in bondage to anyone. How can you say you will be made free? These were the scribes and the Pharisees who were so focused on the law, on being perfect on their own, that they, they're, they're trying to achieve. And the truth is, God will show us that we cannot. We cannot achieve the law. The law says you shall not murder. But Jesus said, if you're even angry with a person without a cause, you've committed murder. The law says, if you uh, do not commit adultery, but I say to you, Jesus said, if you even lust after a person, you've committed adultery in your heart. Just to show us that there is no way we can be righteous on our own. We're all guilty. We're all in bondage to sin because of the law. It is through surrender and receiving the gift of the sacrifice that cleanses our sins, the blood of Jesus Christ, that we are truly set free when we stop trying to justify ourselves and rest in the justification of Jesus Christ, who was perfect. Praise the Lord. Jesus answered them, most assuredly, I say to you, whoever commits sin is a slave of sin. We talked about that with the, you know, the Israelites in Egypt. We talked about how if we commit any sin, uh, then we become a slave to it and we need to be set free because the price of sin is death. And a slave does not abide in the house forever, but a son or daughter abides forever. Therefore, if the Son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. Praise the Lord. But even when we get set free, when we give our lives to Christ and we know it, we have that experience. Just like the Israelites in Egypt and they knew that they were set free. We have that seat being set free, but then there's these forces that want to cause us to try to perfect ourselves again. Because we think, okay, well, I've been set free. Now I've got this. I'm going to be good on my own. And we end up in bondage again. And that's not what God wants for us. To be set free, we must be born again. That's the way it is. We were born of woman into this world, into the flesh, and into the law. And we were born in sin. And we have a death sentence awaiting us. But John, John chapter 3, verses 1 through 7, there was a man of the Pharisees. The religious rulers named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, see, he's afraid to go during the day and be seen. He says to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. He let the blind see and the mute speak, the cripples walk, and he even raised the dead. And that was all signs that, that God had sent him. And Nicodemus understood that. There's no way a human being could do all that unless God sent him. Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. You can see all these signs and wonders, but you cannot have a relationship. You cannot see things spiritually unless you're born again. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? And I like how in The Chosen, Nicodemus says, well, that my mother's already passed on, and there's no way for me to do that. Jesus answered, most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That water, I believe, is when the water breaks, so we're born into this world, and then again, we're born in the Spirit, 
when we are surrendered to God and receive the gift of salvation. Otherwise, we cannot enter the kingdom. We may come to the gates, and if we don't have the spirit of Christ, we cannot enter. And so we, we must be born again. That which is born of the flesh is the flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. Praise the Lord. That's how we're set free from the law, because the word tells us that when he does that, he puts the law in our hearts. We don't want to do the things against God or anymore. We're not thinking about selfishness. We want to please God. We want to do the right thing. We want to be a blessing to others. So he puts that in us. So we're not restricted by a bunch of rules. We're just now able to hear God's voice and walk with him as he decides what he wants to change in us day by day, transforming us into his image. We're not there yet, but he's doing that work. Praise the Lord. All right, before I get any further, are there any questions, comments, or revelations so far? I have a, a question. Sure, Pastor Rufus. Now, those uh, that comment that uh, Jesus made to Nicodemus, uh, unless one is born by um, water and the spirit he not can he he will not have eternal life uh, or the, the the rebirth the new life so Amen. now was this what was being represented when Jesus died and the uh the uh soldier pierced him and water and blood came out now was that meant to represent the two the the, the two births in your opinion? Um, I don't think so. Uh, but I mean, it's possible. But he doesn't mention the blood, right? He doesn't mention the blood there. He talks about you born, the born of the flesh, born of the spirit. And then he gives the examples of water and spirit. And so, uh, you know, the... Uh, okay, so you're saying the water that came out of Jesus' side makes us born in the Spirit. Is that what you're trying to say, Pastor Rufus? Uh, well, no, just the opposite. The blood made us born in the Spirit. Okay. Christ's death. And the water okay. represented the first birth from the womb. Oh, okay. Oh, that's interesting. Uh, well, I'm... Yeah, my 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 for sure. I'm no, uh, I'm not the final authority. I think it's an interesting uh, take on that, and, and it that would fit. The water would represent our first birth, and the blood would represent our spiritual birth. I like it. Nice. Amen. Amen. Anyone else? Any other comments, revelations, questions? All right. Praise the Lord. There are some who might think that the water is a water baptism, but there are plenty of examples of why that probably isn't the case, because there were people who had not even been baptized yet that received the spirit once they believed. And there were also the man on the cross we know was saved and he never had a chance to get baptized. So that's why uh, that particular representation doesn't seem to be supported in the word. But the baptism does have a very powerful uh, purpose in our walk on this earth. So do not discount baptism. It's absolutely necessary for our spiritual growth. Praise the Lord. Okay, let's go on. A new life. We talk about being born again. Now, Romans 7, chapters, uh, verses 1 through 6 says, Or do you not know, brethren, for I speak to those who know the law, that the law has dominion over a man as long as he lives. So we're born into, into this world and we're actually born under the law. In other words, we're going to be held accountable when we're born into this world to um, the standards that God has set, which is, you know, again, do not murder, do not steal, do not um, commit adultery and all those things. And when we try to live up to that, we... We're stuck. We're, we, we can't do it. And so as long as we live, just like in a relationship, uh, a godly relationship, uh, 
that, that the law has dominion over the man as long as he lives. For the woman who has a husband is bound by the law to her husband as long as he lives. But if the husband dies, she is released from the law of her husband. So then if while her husband lives, she marries another man, she will be called an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she is, no, she is free from that law so that she is no, no adulteress, though she has married another man. Therefore, my brethren, you also have become dead to the law through the body of Christ, that you may be married to another. So this is important. In other words, when we surrender ourselves to the gift of salvation and give our lives to Christ, we are surrendering like dying. Sometimes people talk about baptism, that you go down like you're going in the earth and you come back up alive in Christ. You're now part of Christ and not your own person. You're his. And so when we die to the law and we are in Christ, we are free. To him who was raised from the dead, that we should bear fruit to God, which is fruit of the spirit that he gives us. Love, joy, peace, kindness, gentleness, patience, self-control, gentle goodness. All those things come from God. And when we are born again and we give up our life, he gives us all those that fruit. Praise the Lord. From when we were in the flesh, in the world, before we gave our lives to Christ, the sinful passions which were aroused by the law were at work in our members to bear fruit to death. You see, like, um, I don't know if I have it here. No, Paul, Paul said, uh, you know, I had no, would have not known covetousness unless I knew the law. But when I saw that I should not covet, which is wanting something that's not mine, all of a sudden I become very covetous because the flesh is so against the law. So all of a sudden, you don't do the things you want to do. So when we were in the flesh, the sinful passions which were aroused by the law were at work in our members to bear fruit to death. But now we have been delivered from the law, having died to what we were held by, so that we should serve in the newness of the spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. Amen. And this is where really all of us get caught somewhere in our journey. We, we feel like we have to live up to the law but God's not saying that. God is saying, listen, walk with me and I will tell you what I want you to confess, what I want you to surrender when it's time. And um, I'll give a quick example. I don't know if I said this already, but I was giving a testimony when I was a, just a born again Christian very at the very beginning. Um, uh, within probably weeks of my 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 born-again experience, I was explaining to someone who I knew for a long time uh, about my experience, and I used a foul word, and I didn't even think about it. I was just, you know, because I was a sailor, and I was already I used to saying those words, and I said all this stuff, and I didn't notice anything. I didn't get convicted. I was tell giving my testimony. I was very experience, uh, uh, excited when I was giving it, but then he stopped and said, did you say that word? And when he said that, oh my goodness, it's like the light went out and I felt like I was doomed to hell and all that kind of stuff because someone pointed out the law to me about saying a bad word and the enemy took advantage of that and, and really knocked me down. But God did not convict me because he was busy doing something else in my heart. He was going to deal with my language and his timing but he wasn't convicting me then because there were other things like unforgiveness or needing to reconcile with someone that he was working with in my heart in those days. So it's not about certain looking at all the stuff that's written and trying to live up to it. Otherwise, we're literally turning away from God who redeemed us and trying again to be righteous on our own. And it's not going to happen. It brings death, spiritual death. Amen. Questions, comments, revelations about any of that? I know this is a lot, but uh, just get it in you. God's going to give you the revelation. Praise the Lord. Now we jump to Romans 8, verses 1 through 10. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Okay, so if we give our lives to him, we make him Lord of our lives. We're in him. There's no condemnation when we fail, even though that's what the enemy tried to do to me when I said that bad word. Who do not walk according to the flesh, which is the law, but according to the spirit, which is 
listening to his leading, his voice, and gui letting him guide us. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. I don't need to look at that list of commandments to a 613 laws and try to live up to them. What I got to do is walk with God. And God, you lead me and show me whatever you want me to surrender. And that's what we're going to do. That's what we're going to do. We're going to confess it and give it to you. And you're going to take it away and make me more like you. Praise the Lord. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh, likeness because he was not sinful, but he looked like a human being, except he didn't have any sin. On account of sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. That the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh or the law, but according to the spirit. Our righteousness that grants us entry into heaven is the blood of Jesus Christ, as Pastor Rufus said. And it's what gave us the spirit of God. And so our when we come before the pearly gates and they say, why should you come in here? It's because we believe in the righteous one who accomplished the law. He fulfilled it all. And we put our trust in him and we cover ourselves in his blood. And that's how we get in, not because we're good enough but because he's good enough. Amen. Praise the Lord. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the spirit, the things of the spirit. And the things according to the flesh includes the law. For to be carnally or fleshly minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Praise the Lord. Even to this day, I still get attacked when I think I've done something wrong and I, I'm not just at peace anymore because the enemy comes in and starts to condemn me and I lose my peace and there's a struggle because God has still not brought me to that place where I'm just totally at rest in him, trusting him and, and just only listening for conviction in my heart and not this condemnation that comes uh, from the other. So it's not something we all just get perfectly until he does it in us but he's teaching us how praise the lord because the carnal or fleshly mind is enmity or an enemy against god for it is not subject to the law of god nor indeed can be so then those who are in the flesh cannot please god if we're not walking in the spirit we cannot please god that's the bottom line that's why jesus told nicodemus you must be born again in the spirit because if you're walking in the flesh you cannot please god you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven but you are not in the flesh but in the spirit if indeed the spirit of god dwells in you now if anyone does not have the spirit of christ he is not his that means if we don't have the spirit of christ we are going to be held by the same law that everyone else is, carry, is is held by, which means if we've ever been angry with with someone without a cause, if we've ever slandered anyone, if we've ever stolen anything, if we've ever lusted after anyone in our heart ever, we will be held accountable for it. There's no question about it. So what's the answer? The answer is... Jesus paid the price for that sin. And if we turn to him and say, okay, I have sinned and I, I accept that sacrifice of Jesus Christ and I now surrender my life to him so that I can walk with God and, and be saved and be transformed, that's the way. That's the way. And that's when we receive his spirit. And if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin. In other words, this body is going to, stay behind and all that but the spirit is life because of righteousness praise the lord and it's something you experience when you truly repent turn from your way and give your life to him you experience this freedom this life that that's why people don't turn away i mean they'll, they'll never go back they, they don't want they want why they're so excited about being born again because you get this amazing experience of the spirit of god where you experience what true love is through peace, through joy, and it's a wonderful thing. Praise yeah, I think the Lord. Pastor Steve blocked up. Um, I can hear you, Brother Mark. Can you hear me? Can anyone hear me? Oh, no. 
Okay, let me stop share. Can anyone hear me? No one hears me? All right, Pastor Tyrone. Okay, looks like I'm back now. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes, yes. we hear you, Pastor. Okay, can you tell me where I left off? Anyone know? I can't. Not? Okay. Was I done with Romans 8, verse 1 through 10? Can anybody remember that? I can't. You are almost done with Romans 8. Okay. All right. Let's see what I can do here for my... Um... Wow. All right. Can't minimize that. One moment, please. I've got a screen share again. That's what I got to do. All right. All right. How about that? And we're recording again. Let me see. Yes, we're recording. I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, let me see if I can go back. So uh, did we talk about if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he is not his? Did anyone hear that? Yeah, I think you're past that. Okay. Yeah. All right. So the bottom line is here, okay? And that is that when we are born again, when we, when we recognize... If we're in the flesh, we are going to be held by those laws. We're going to be held by if we ever got angry with someone without a cause, we committed murder. If we've ever taken anything that wasn't ours, we've committed theft. And when we've uh, lusted after a person, we've committed adultery. And we'll be held to those things if we don't have the spirit of Christ. That's that's what's what we'll be measured up against. And, and if we ever dishonored the Sabbath or had an idol or any of those things, if we ever dishonored our parents, all those things we'd be guilty of. And so then the answer is the one who was perfect, who fulfilled that law. If we turn from our way and we believe that his sacrifice is good enough and we surrender our lives to him, we receive his spirit. And then we have this amazing experience that everyone talks about we actually our eyes spiritual eyes are open we have peace and freedom and life and hope and all of that and we know that we've been set free and then we don't have to look at all these laws all we have to do is walk with christ who will cause us to walk out those laws his way in his timing amen any questions comments revelations sorry for the inter interruption Okay, back to our story then. Uh, but basically, the whole story of Ishmael and Isaac is this. We're, we're following the chosen generation, which is Isaac. They were the ones of promise. The promise was to those who believed. And so we are born like Ishmael, not receiving any promise, but for those who would. And so under the law and held under all that bondage, but when we see the truth and we turn to the truth and we say, okay, I'm guilty. I give my life to you and I trust in your sacrifice. Now we become the Isaacs, the Abrahams, the Isaacs, the Jacobs. And we are now spiritual children of God. And all these promises are now ours. Amen. Praise the Lord. All right. Let's finish up the, this um, chapter here. Verse 17 these were the years of the life of Ishmael, 137 years, and he breathed his last and died and was gathered to his people. Amen. They dwelt from Havilah as far as Shur, which is east of Egypt, and go and you go to Assyria, toward Assyria. He died in the presence of all his brethren. This is the genealogy of Isaac. Okay, that's, that's it for Ishmael. Now, the genealogy of Isaac, Abraham's son, the chosen one, the one of of the promise. Abraham begot Isaac. Isaac was 40 years old when he took Rebekah as wife, 
the daughter of Bethuel, the Syrian, of Tainab Aram, the sister of Laban, the Syrian. Amen. So he was 40 when he became married to her. Remember, that's an important thing. He was 40 years old. Now Isaac pleaded with the Lord for his wife because she was barren. So the most important thing for people in those days was to be fruitful and multiply. And a woman was considered, she was mocked if she couldn't have children. And so Isaac stands in the gap for his wife because she couldn't have children. And the Lord granted his plea and Rebekah, his wife, conceived. But the children struggled together within her, and she said, if all is well, why am I like this? So she went to inquire of the Lord. Things are going rough. He turned to the Lord. And the Lord said to her, two nations are in your womb. Two peoples shall be separated from your body. One people shall be stronger than the other, and the older shall serve the long, younger a man. And so this is a prophecy before the children are even born. All these are important things that we're going to talk about as we go forward. So when her days were fulfilled for her to give birth, indeed, there were twins in her womb. And the first came out red. He was like a hairy garment all over. So they called his name Esau. Afterward, his brother came out and his hand took hold of Esau's heel, so his name was called Jacob. Amen. All right, so we had Abraham, and we have Isaac, and now Isaac's having two sons right here, Esau and Jacob. The meaning of the name Esau is a doer or maker or worker. Now, we learn in the New Testament that as we are um, walking with God, if we are in Christ, our works can be counted as debt. In other words, if we think that we know what needs to happen and we do things on our own, just like Sarah did with having Ishmael, it's it's not counted as favor or a blessing. It's our own works. It's trying to be God when God is the only one who can do everything right. And so we see here Esau is kind of a person who makes things happen. And of course, in the world, that's lifted up very highly. But in the kingdom of God, it's those who become his children and just follow their father in heaven and let him work through us is the ones that are blessed. Praise the Lord. There's no faith in doing our own works. There's faith in trusting God and him working through us. Praise the Lord. And of course, the other one was named Jacob. And the definition of the name Jacob is two things. He who closely follows, and that's always a blessing, just like a sheep. To be a shepherd, we have to be a sheep first, and we follow the lead of our shepherd, Jesus Christ. And he was his name also makes a, means a supplanter. In other words, taking the place, stealing, like uh, take, overtaking somebody, supplanting them. Those, those names are important. So we go back to verse 26. Afterward, his brother came out, and his hand took hold of Esau's heel, so his name was called Jacob. So he's, he's already grabbing his older brother's heel. And of course, in those days, they always believed that the oldest was the one who was going to inherit all the blessings and the responsibilities. And here he is grabbing Esau's heel. Isaac was 60 years old when she bore them. Well, why is this here? Remember, how old was he when he got married? He was 40 years old. He, he pleaded for his wife to have children, and she had children when he was 60 years old. Do not grow weary in praying for whatever your burden is. It may happen instantly and it may take 20 years to happen. But God hears our prayers and he is faithful to answer our prayers. And this is a fine example of patience in prayer. She finally had the child after 20 years. Praise the Lord. Any questions, comments, revelations so far? Okay, praise the Lord. So the boys grew, and Esau was a skillful hunter, a man of the field, but Jacob was a mild man dwelling in tents. Again, in this world, people who are action hunters or make, making things happen are considered very lifted up very highly, but Jacob was a mild man dwelling in tents, kind of weak, and uh, he, he looked after sheep is what he did, as, as all the children of promise did. And Isaac loved Esau because he ate of his game. He satisfied his flesh with his 
meat that he would get. But Rebecca loved Jacob. And Rebecca being the mother, the mother kind of represents like the Holy Spirit and wisdom. Uh, now Jacob cooked a stew and Esau came in from the field and he was weary. And Esau said to Jacob, please feed me with that same red stew for I am weary. For his name was called, therefore his name was called Edom. And I didn't put the definition, but but uh, Edom is the generations of Esau. But Jacob said, sell me your birthright as of this day. Now remember his name means supplanter, right? So he's already trying to make things happen on his own. So he says, okay, I want the birthright. I want to carry on the name and all the promises. So he's making a move on his own. And Esau said, look, I'm about to die. So what is this birthright to me? He thinks he's gonna die. Then Jacob gets it anyway. Then Jacob said, swear to me as of this day. So he swore to him and he sold his birthright to Jacob. And Jacob gave Esau bread and stew of lentils. Then he ate and drank and arose and went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. Amen. Remember, it said the older shall serve the younger. That was already prophesied before it ever happened. And now he's despising. He gives up his birthright that he rightly had just to satisfy his flesh. This is very important in our walk today. Uh, and the New Testament tells us that in the book of Hebrews. This is, again, written for Christians. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 14 through 17. Pursue peace with all people and holiness, in other words, being set apart, without which no one will see the Lord. Looking carefully, lest anyone fall short of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up cause trouble, and by this many become defiled, and bitterness can happen in our hearts. If we sense it, we need to confess it and get prayer and not let it grab root and bring us all the way down. Lest there be any fornicator or profane person like Esau, who for one morsel of food sold his birthright. For you know that afterward, when he wanted to inherit the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place for repentance, though he sought it with diligently with tears. Amen. So what is this whole story? Is that we have flesh and we have spirit. And the flesh wants to satisfy itself with things of the world that are not of God. And we, we can forfeit our spiritual walk with God by just trying to satisfy the needs of our flesh. That's spiritual death. We read about that earlier today. And so we don't ever want to go that way. We need to be in prayer and we need to ask God to help us because the truth is, as long as we have to have flesh, it's going to fight against God and it's going to want to satisfy itself, whether it's food or lust or whatever it is, uh, it fights against what God is doing in us. Any questions, comments, or revelations about that or anything we covered today. This is deep stuff and no one's expected to get it, figure it all out, but here's the bottom line. The bottom line is we are seeing examples of a chosen generation of promise and those who are not. And those who are not are under bondage. They are under the law. And because of that, there's no hope for being under the law except judgment. But the beauty is that when we recognize that we have sinned, we have broken the law, God made a way. He so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, the one that had no sin, <clears throat> and sacrificed him as a gift for all of us. And that we can, we can receive that, that wonderful gift. All it is for us to say, okay, if I can avoid my judgment... And I decide, okay, God, I want it your way. If it's just to save ourselves. But the truth is that God is love. God is everything we ever wanted in our lives. And peace and joy. All the good things is who he is. So it's not just about saving our skin. And the truth is everything we've ever wanted. A future of a, no more pain and no more suffering. But nothing but love and, and joy and everything. All those things come to, from God. And so we can actually pursue those things by giving our life to him and letting him take over and he'll bring us all the way to that. 
And then we're born of the spirit and we can hear God's voice and we can follow him and we can rest because we don't have to live up to a bunch of rules. He will make us live up to those rules, his way, his timing, and we can find rest. Praise the Lord. Again, any questions, comments, revelations before we sign off? Uh, yes, just one comment, Pastor. Uh, this message will end here today, but the to be continued is something that will happen on Saturday, right where you left off with uh, Esau. <laughs> Wow. wow. He despises blessing. We'll pick up there on Saturday. Wow. <laughs> wow. All right. Praise the Lord how God works. Well, we will also pick up on Thursday for those who can't be with us on Saturday, but it's exciting to hear that Pastor Rufus will be giving a message on this very subject. And that's just another another proof that that's a big Bible. And somehow we keep intertwining all these because God is the one leading us all. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Pastor Rufus. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Pastor Steve. Amen. Well, Heavenly Father, we just thank you. We thank you for this word and help us not get beat up if we don't understand everything. But your word is seed and you plant it in our hearts and then you water it. And then you are the one who gives all the increase. So we can just rest assured that you're going to make all sense out of all this. And we just pray that you do water those seeds and keep us hungry for your word, keep us learning, keep us in this story so we can get to know you and find everything we're looking for in our lives. And thank you for this word. Bring us back next week and also on Sabbath Saturday. We look forward to it all in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. For everyone here, for everyone listening in the future, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Praise the Lord. And that's our word for today. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen.